Thank you. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Can we go to the next slide, Jenny? Um, thank you for joining us on this webinar about supporting trans adult education students' transition to training and employment. Uh, I am Peter Simon, one of the partners in the High Road Alliance. Just really quickly, you know, High Road Alliance, which has now been around for about a year, uh, is a, a, we are focused on really expanding the availability of training programs that integrate teaching and learning of academic, technical, workplace, digital skills, hands-on experience, and really um, emphasizing the importance of leveraging partnerships uh, to build high quality programs that lead to good jobs. Um, over the last year, we've worked with workers in unions, employers, community colleges, adult schools, workforce boards, CBOs, really all with a focus on creating more avenues, opportunities for people to get into living wage jobs. And this, and this focus is particularly on the opportunities for adult learners. Um, myself, I'm a retired community college dean. Prior to that, I was uh, a number of years basic skills English instructor at Laney College and started out as an adult educator teaching GED classes at the Alameda Adult School. Um, I've also worked in the, with a number of adult ed consortia around career pathways, contextualized teaching, immigrant integration, and developing plans. Jenny. Hi, my name's Jenny Mollica. I'm also a co-founder of High Road Alliance. Um, my background includes many years as an ESL teacher. I also worked in immigrant and refugee services and in workforce development for a number of nonprofits. Um, for the past 10 years, I've been consulting mainly around career pathway development often supporting complicated partnerships coming together. Um, I've done some research over the last few years on English learners access to apprenticeship. And that has had me particularly interested in, in how to develop these strong pathways into really high quality jobs. So I'm really happy to be here with all of you today. Thanks to everyone for joining us. We have three objectives for today's webinar. Um, and the first is to learn about research that Peter and I have been doing over the past many months on effective transition practices from adult ed into post-secondary education and employment in California. And I wanna thank many of you who are on the webinar today because you are among those who we interviewed um, to learn about the effective practices that you're using in your work. Um, and it's those practices that we summarized in the brief, which Veronica has shared in the chat box. Hope you all will have a chance to read that. Um, it's also what we're hoping to summarize today, although, although what we're gonna share with you today is really a very high level, um, just a brief mm -hmm. glance at what we learned from, from the chance we had to talk to so many of you. It was really, the conversations were really rich. There was a lot shared. We tried to sum it up in the brief and we hope that you'll take a few minutes to read that over. Um, what we're gonna share on this webinar is that, is that high level summary. And then what we've chosen is to invite a panel of some of those adult education leaders who we spoke with in these interviews so that they can share with you about the work they're doing supporting students' transitions. And we invited those who are here with us today on this panel because their work is especially going deep in this area of transition um, and because they really um, represent a lot of those themes that we heard in the research. So our second objective is to hear directly from them about their work. And then toward the end of the webinar, we want to provide a little bit of time for some Q&A with the panelists, some discussion. Um, and this is hopefully going to invite further discussion. And we're going to share with you at the very end an opportunity to continue this conversation with us in the months to come. Okay. Can you go? I just this we just we open up the brief and we're opening up this presentation with this 
great quote that came from, I believe, 2015. Um, and I don't normally read PowerPoint slides, but I think I'm going to read this statement because really we see this as kind of the overarching framing objective of the CAPE program, which is to rethink and redesign an educational system that creates seamless transitions for students across adult schools and community colleges to accelerate academic and career success in order to earn a living wage. Just that's kind of our North Star with this whole project. Next slide. So a graphic that's included in the report we produced and that we wanted to share at this point is really meant to describe what do we mean when we talk about transition support. And I think it's, it's helpful here to see that the, the end goal in mind, if you think of this really from the student's perspective, is, is over on the, the right-hand side where students may have goals around getting into community college, entering employment, or in some cases entering a short-term occupational training program. And on the left side, you see adult education, and there we're just listing the, the, um, the CAPE program areas. Um, what goes between to connect the dots for someone who's, who's in adult education and wanting to transition into to college or employment can be a whole number of different things. And so what you see summarized in the green in the middle is, is really some of the areas of this work that we heard in the interviews. Um, and we did hear these grouped into a few areas. There were a number of um, examples, many, many examples actually related to curriculum and instruction. There were also many examples related to student support services. There was also a lot said about the importance of partnerships and how those come together to create these seamless paths um, to really shape those bridges. And then there was, there was quite a bit also said about intention <coughs> behind organizational structure. Um, and along with that, we kind of grouped the, the funding piece of that. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about, about the work in these four areas. Something we wanted to point out here is that um, really to a large extent, this what falls into this transition support is what adult education has been always doing. And so it, it's not an, an entity unto itself. It's very much a part of the adult education world, and it's a part of the adult education program in California, as we've been saying. It's also, I think we heard from the people we interviewed, it's perhaps especially important right now during the post-pandemic recovery, as so many adults are, are struggling, needing to retool skills, um, needing to think about what, what path they need to take to get back to employment or to get to a, a, a more stable job or, or financial situation. Um, so this, this graphic is something that we use as kind of an organizing principle in the, the report. And just to briefly summarize, no, go ahead. Can you hear me? Okay. You can hear me. All right. Um, we just sure. to quickly note that we, we interviewed uh, representatives, administrators, instructors, staff, from 30 different consortia around the state. And we made a real effort to, do, to make sure that we had a broad geographic representation. And I think with a particular emphasis on hearing from more rural or geographically dispersed consortia, because I think as you know out there that they often have slightly different challenges and issues than highly urbanized condensed areas. Um, on the right is a list of all the areas where we ask questions. I'm not going to read you that list. You can see that. And I'll make yet another plug that we'd really like you to read the brief and we'd like your feedback on it, but there's much more detail than we're going to be able to cover today. Next slide. So here's a picture of the brief that you all should either have received or get download from the chat today. And we, this is an, actually an advert for reading the brief. Okay. So we wanted to share with you some of the themes that came up when we, we talked to consortia leaders, leaders about their effective practices. 
Um, and there were a few key themes that we thought kind of crossed over all these areas of the transition work. And then we, we wanted to call out here before we get into more detail. Um, one of these is, is that um, we really heard a lot about the need for integration and the ways that consortia are integrating their programs and services in really creative and innovative ways to make them work for their adult students. So this might happen formally in the case of an integrated education and training program that's that's has deeply woven interwoven curriculum and co-teaching, or it may happen more informally in the ways that partners work together and weave in support services. Um, there were many programs that were trying to integrate many things, not just two. Mm -hmm. um, there was sort of a sense of the more the better. Um, and, and often this was done to accelerate someone's movement through the program in the case of integrating basic skills in career education, or just to ease navigation so that it was, it was experienced more seamlessly for the person going through. And there was really a lot of intentionality um, and thoughtfulness around meeting the needs of the whole person. Um, and often that going beyond the classroom to remove any kind of barriers or create any kind of conditions that would be needed to, to ease the transition. Um, we also heard so much about partnerships um, and you'll see many examples of this. Often these um, would involve co-location of services and programs under one roof um, or just very, very um, collaborative efforts. And again, this would sort of bridge gaps um, or, or support the kind of navigation that would have to go on for someone to move from one program to another. We also heard a real emphasis, and I think you'll hear this from our panelists today, about the importance of personalized and very relationship-based services, and those being key to supporting someone through a transition into a new program, a new system, a new campus, whatever that looks like. Um, so these were themes that, again, I think you'll hear um, throughout the panel discussion, but we just wanted to call them out in advance. And again, this, this graphic here just breaks down really the structure of the brief and the different areas that we, that we focused on. And I think that's pretty straightforward. I'm not going to read that slide to you. But, um, you know, again, I just want to note that we went into this research project with the assumption that there's a lot of practices out there that really aren't getting highlighted enough. And our assumption was really borne out that we, our problem was one, one of riches, that we got so much information from all of you that our job was to kind of how to fit it all into a thing that was not a huge compendium. So under curriculum instruction, uh, and again, this is really the structure of the brief, so you can, you can read the brief and get more details. We broke that down into short-term CTE programs, and there were many, many different examples of those. One that we highlighted in the brief was from the Riverside Consortium, where they've worked with their local school districts. And as jobs become available within the, their partner school districts, they actually have customized training, short-term training programs in addition to the other adult school classes people are taking to prepare them for a targeted occupation. Um, we heard a great deal about integrated education and training. Some of you community college folks might think of that as IBEST, where you have two teachers somehow working together, often a basic skills and a CTE instructor. Uh, one notable example was uh, out in Stockton area with the Delta Sierra Alliance, did a health bridge, summer health bridge program where they had a adult school ESL teacher team up with one of the nursing staff at, adult, uh, at, at the community college in Stockton. And it was really a terrific program where I think it was six weeks, there, they combined language with medical terminology and a lot of background on health occupations. People got a, a CPR certificate and a large number of the people who went through that short term summer bridge um, went on to enroll in uh, healthcare related fields after that experience. Uh, mirrored classes, I don't know how many of you use mirrored classes, but 
it's possible for community colleges to offer a section that is credit, like credit ESL or CTE, and a non-credit concurrent section. And that allows adult school students, it allows undocumented students to take community college classes uh, in the mirrored class format. Uh, I think one example in the, in the brief was uh, down at El Camino College, the South Bay Consortium down there. Um, they've actually created mirrored sections for their entire ESL offering, which creates a great deal more access for adult ed students. Some of those are offered at the adult school. Some of them are offered at the community college. Um, Pre-apprenticeships and bridge programs, they're really in themselves very meaty topics. We've done a great deal of work around pre-apprenticeship programs and a, a very growing number of uh, consortia are either operating or thinking of setting up pre-apprenticeship programs. They're of particular importance around what's going to be needed in the massive retraining efforts as the post-pandemic recovery. And um, Nancy Miller, who is on this uh, panel, can talk a bit about the pre-apprenticeship program they set up, which is around fire abatement and land. That's, oh, that's <laughs> next week? Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry. <laughs> next but week's panel. It's Santa Rosa, Santa Rosa Consortium, the Sonoma County Consortium, actually has a pre-apprenticeship that leads directly into an apprenticeship that's, uh, take a look at this take a look at the brief. Um, bridge programs, there's many, many different kinds of bridge programs. Um, I think I'll leave it at that. Re Can we go to the next slide, please? Sure, so this, this next group, and yeah, we're kind of flying through these, but I think um, it's worth mentioning these different types of, um, of practices. And there are a whole number that, that we grouped under student support services um, there was a lot of emphasis in the interviews we did among the, uh, around the important role of these dedicated staff people, transition counselors, transition specialists, whatever you call them, navigators, um, who are there to help bridge that gap. And, and they're often um, following people from the adult school to the community college or supporting them in um, finding employment. Um, often these positions, uh, they, they look a whole, a whole variety of different ways, but often they have a presence at the adult school um, or wherever the student is taking their adult, uh, adult education classes and at a community college. So they're, they're visible in both places and identified with both places. Um, sometimes they co-locate with community-based organizations as well to have more of a connection in the community. Often these individuals are bilingual. Um, and they're also often teaching these transition support classes, not always, but often it's in that same um, individual who's in the classroom supporting students around their career exploration, um, uh, sort of college success um, curriculum, or helping them understand how to navigate the transition from one system to another. Um, some of these transition support classes are required either for anyone in a CTE program or anyone in a GED program. Um, there are interesting examples of how they're, they're sort of pushed forward to encourage a student to think about what the next steps are beyond that class or program. Um, there were also a whole number of examples of how technology was being used to support the kind of holistic case management that consortia found to be necessary for the transition. Um, some of this was related to data sharing um, there were also examples of online tools, certainly more so in the pandemic, online tools being used for um, counselors to, to participate in some way in, in the classes, um, make themselves known, or to allow for students to book appointments with the transition counselor. Um, and then there were some, there were some examples of um, using technology to help students at the adult school to apply for the community college. So helping them to access those um, technology tools that were available. And then these last two points here are peer tutoring and peer mentoring. Um, and there were some great examples of adult school students who've been able to progress to, to college level instruction or to the community college campus 
um, being called on to, to be that near peer support for someone who was yet to make that transition. And this happened both um, uh, sort of supporting, understanding the application process and getting ready, and then also having a presence on the community college campus and being a support there, a friendly face as someone actually begins their, their college education. Another section of the brief addresses partnerships, which again, as Jenny noted, is really an overarching critical theme throughout what we've learned. Um, and when, you may wonder why we mentioned community colleges, they're part of the consortium, but there's been a wide variation on how much community colleges and adult schools really collaborate together in offering instruction. I think with the advent of Senate Bill 554, we've seen an uptick of practices of co-enrollment where the adult school students are actually enrolled at the college. And oftentimes non-credit classes are being offered at, by the community college at an adult school. Sort of the, the extension of that is several consortia have developed what we call interagency service agreements where the community college can offer non-credit classes at the, at the adult school and the adult school can actually count those as part of their outcomes. And what that does is it frees up adult, the, the CAPE funds to, to offer a broader range of classes and ultimately serve more students. Um, we heard many, many examples of different ways of collaborating with the public workforce system uh, some of our panelists can talk about that today. Uh, they range from co-location of services, some um, in, in uh, the North Central uh, Consortium, they actually have uh, adult school classes offered at the one stops. And also in terms of uh, the public workforce system being able to offer really valuable uh, material support uh, and even placement support for people to get jobs. Other public agencies, we heard a wide range again, ranging from the probation department, CalWORKs, CalFresh, the Department of uh, Vocational Rehabilitation with different programs serving adults with disabilities. Um, a lot of partnerships with employers and industry groups. Uh, one highlighted in the brief consortium is actually part of this whole regional consortium around manufacturing and adult students in that consortium can take very short term to nine month long training programs that have built in on the job experience and placement all through this uh, Sacramento wide consortium. And of course, community based organizations are critical in terms of reach partnering with them to serve our various populations, sometimes offering adult ed classes at their sites. Uh, one one uh, consortium we highlight actually has a, a, a community program built in an abandoned school where the CBO is doing the recruitment for the program. It's a pre-apprenticeship program, provides childcare um, and provides supportive services. Okay, next slide. Okay, I'm gonna speak really briefly on this slide, not because the organizational structure isn't important, but because we were really eager to move on to our panel. Um, and some of these points were, were touched on in the earlier themes, but um, there was an interest among several consortia and the ways that they as a consortium could intentionally support transition. So there were examples like the interagency service agreement with Peter mentioned of really sort of formalizing some of the partnerships that made up the consortium, um, maintaining funds, including CAPE funds, but also potentially other leverage funds at the consortium level intentionally for those collaborative activities, um, really designing some, some deeply collaborative work involving co-teaching and co-counseling and, um, and looking at the different funding sources that can be leveraged when, when these relationships are, are deepened and formalized. So with that, I think we wanna move on to our panel and um, yes, I'll turn it over to you, Peter, to introduce this slide. Okay, well, we're very lucky to have as our panelists today, practitioners who are 
really doing uh, exemplary work out there in terms of some of the effective practices that we've talked about. Um, we're going to be posing some questions to them. We're going to ask them to pose questions for each other. Um, this is not a shy group, so I'm going to be quiet and get out of the way. And I'd like uh, our panelists to introduce themselves. Why don't we just go down the list here? Emma, would you like to start out, please? Yes. Good. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for the invite. And I'm Emma Diaz, and so I'm the uh, director for the consortium for the Inland Adult Education Consortium, and we are located in San Bernardino. I guess I'll go next. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Pete Gonzalez. Um, I'm part of the Inland Adult Education Consortium, uh, more specifically an academic transition counselor for San Bernardino Valley College. Great. And Frank? I'm Frank Gerdeman. Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. I'm the director of ADVANCE, uh, formerly known as the Lake Tahoe Adult Education Consortium, and we're in South Lake Tahoe, California. And finally, Eric. Hello, everyone. I'm Eric Pomeroy, the director of the North Central Adult Ed Consortium, which is out of Sutter County, California, and includes Yuba, Calusa, Yolo, and Lake County, so five county consortium. I also have the privilege of overseeing our local adult ed program as well as our Sutter County One Stop. Just five counties? Just yes, just five. Yeah. Actually, <laughs> half, okay, because Mendocino has the other half of legs, so let's just Okay. Jenny. Okay. You have... Well, we're going to move into our panel discussion now. And the first question we came up with to kick this off is what have you found to be most important to keeping transition front and center in your consortium's work? And we're going to start with the Inland Consortium. Emma and Pete. Um, well, I'll start with kind of giving an overview of how transition is central for us. And I'm going to say it goes back to the beginning of AB 86. And when we put our regional plan together, um, we actually had a transitions work group. We pulled together individuals from uh, the, both the college campuses and the adult ed sites, including I even think we had some of our ROP folks on there. And we had a facilitated discussion just on transitions. And uh, we used an independent facilitator to kind of help us uh, go through all the different, I'm gonna say stages of developing a vision for transition. And initially we started with discussing what the barriers were. Just looking at the barriers and had a dialogue around barriers that students face to transition. Then we developed a practical vision for it of what would it look like if we had all those resources to overcome those barriers. Um, the third step was we, we actually came up with a strategic direction for transitions and developed a, an action plan with a timeline and actually put that into our, uh, you know, back then it was 2015, our regional uh, comprehensive plan that went off to the state for approval during the AB 86 phase. So it was very early on that we developed um, a place to keep it front and center. It was actually, um, like I said, uh, you know, board approved. And really what the vision we set was to create a unified transition network. That's what we were trying to do very early on because we knew students were having issues going between the different systems. And uh, transition has been really part of the uh, consortium organizational structure you know, in hiring right now and having dedicated individuals, we actually gave transition a place. Um, uh, like I said, going back to when we, when we built the regional comprehensive plan and is now part of our, you know, annual plans. And so we keep it central by keeping it as part of the plan, but also revisiting and seeing, um, you know, the outcomes of what mm -hmm. our transitions counselors and advisors are doing. Great, beautiful example should be relevant to to all consortia here, we have to go through that three-year planning process. So good to keep that in mind. Pete, maybe you can speak from the perspective of, of a staff person that now is kind of leading the charge on this. What have you found yeah. most important? Yeah, I was gonna say, um, looking at it more from kind of like in the trenches, right? That practitioner uh, lens. Um, I think for us, it's, it's really staying connected, right? With our students, faculty and staff, um, being that everything's online and virtual, it, it can you know be a bit difficult at times to, to um, to stay connected in that way, right? Um, more so importantly with the students. 
Um, so we have to really work to make ourselves available for our students. Um, there's many times that myself and our other transition counselor, Ms. Maria Lopez, um, are working evenings, sometimes weekends, um, just trying to make ourselves available for our students that are that are working or you know, you know with their kids online or whatnot throughout the day. Um, so really trying to make ourselves um, available to them, and then really staying connected with the faculty and staff at the adult schools. Um, we'll talk about or I'll talk a little about about it later when we talk about resources, but really um, trying to make ourselves available in their classrooms, right through commercials and things of that nature. Um, where the students see that we're there, we're available for them, as well as the faculty and staff. So um, mm -hmm. really staying connected with each other. Great, thanks. Frank, how would you answer that question? Well, I'm really, uh, really glad uh, Emma went because I'll, I can say an awful lot of what Emma did and what they did in Inland uh, with a couple of unique uh, twists uh, for Tahoe. Uh, it has also been front and center from the beginning uh, here. In fact, the work actually predates my arrival uh, as the director in February of, of 2016. Uh, where I think we've we've been a, a little unique in that is that Tahoe didn't have uh, really much, if any, existing infrastructure in terms of uh, maintenance of effort. So the the money that came to this community was really new money. Uh, and we were able to to take a, a really deep look at not only the role of transition and the need of transition in the community, but how we could focus the consortium energy on that work. And so, you know, the early, early work decided that the vast majority of the funding stays at the consortium level. And our member partners who have additional mechanisms for funding uh, and supporting some of the work they do, uh, take small pass-through amounts uh, and continue to be our primary deliverer of instructional services. That's the community college and the K-12 system, uh, especially around uh, career and technical education for older adults. Um, so our primary core service uh, at the consortium level has, has been uh, transition and transition navigator positions from the beginning. The first position hired uh, that I hired after uh, arriving was our first transition navigator in uh, early 2016. Now we have uh, 3.5 uh, FTE uh, folks doing that job in our in our fairly small community. So, like Emma, uh, you know, I was really lucky to sort of come into a consortium where they valued that, and it's it is almost the bedrock uh, of the work that we mm. do uh, here. Mm. Great to hear that. That's um. It hasn't been the same evolution for every consortium, but it's interesting to hear how that was kind of baked in from the start and what the consequences can be, what the outcomes. Um, Eric, same question for you. You know, as Frank said, I'm glad that I went behind Emma and Frank because they said <laughs> a bit of good information. So for us, it's interesting, and and, and we we oversee a one stop. We um, Yuba County and Sutter County both are one of the two organizations or LEAs. Sutter County Superintendent of Schools and Yuba County Office of Ed that actually have a one stop under their purdy. So this put us at an advantage early on because at having a one stop, we, are, we already have a service model in place where we refer and we have interagency meetings. And so we've been doing this quite a while. Um, service transition is at the hub of everything we do, um, whether it's transitioning from a student to work or in between programs or out for a service. Uh, the challenge has been making sure we had the same systems available throughout our consortia, because as we talked about, we have five counties. Um, some of our counties are very rural, so that's been the challenge. Um, we've, we've added a lot of online services through COVID, which we can talk about later. Um, we have added uh, a number of service partners that have helped out tremendously. But for us, just thinking about the word transition, it's goals. And it keeps us connected to the student, as Pete talked about. It's good communication. Um, it's in every one of our goals. And we really are expanding our service platform. One of the other things we did, as, as Frank talked about, is we added navigators in every county. So we have five navigators at this point. Um, we utilize the one-stop counselors. Um, if you're familiar with the one-stop system, typically they have counselors. So we'll talk about how we leverage funds later. And we're using those counselors, again, to support transition in between programs. 
Great, great range of examples. I'm going to go on to the next slide for you, Peter. Okay. So a slightly different angle question is, how are you using CAPE funds and other resources, which we can hear about, and partnerships to keep transition front and center? And uh, Frank, why don't you start off? That actually works well. Uh, believe it or not, Eric, uh, I'm, I think I'm actually going to be able to build a little bit off of your answer to the last question. So it all it all comes around. <laughs> it all it all works full circle. So, so, <laughs> so again, as as I mentioned, we were able to to set aside and allocate funding to this service um, for a, a full time navigator from really from the moment we opened opened the consortia doors here in here, here in Tahoe. Uh, as our uh, service provision grew as our outcomes grew and our impact and partnerships in the community grew, that gave us opportunity uh, to expand that. And so while we don't run or operate or oversee a one-stop in Tahoe, we actually hold the WIOA Title I case management contract with Golden Sierra. So uh, Eric mentioned, you know, using the case managers from the workforce development side in Tahoe. In Tahoe, one of my team members is actually uh, ninety five percent funded uh, through that contract with Golden Sierra. So we are um, the we owe a title one case managers for our community uh, because those jobs really, you know there's a lot of uh, overlap between the work of adult education navigators uh, and workforce development navigators. And then because of I think some of our early work and some of our partnerships with outside organizations like California Conservation Corps, uh, which actually now has um, 14 statewide uh, transition navigators. We, we did some technical assistance work with them to build those positions and continue to do some professional development offerings. And so we have some outside contracts that have, that have allowed us uh, to expand our capacity locally. Uh, so it's really building on that early success of that early vision, again, much like Emma uh, and Inland has, uh, and, and being able to use that to to not only increase our own work, but bring in additional uh, funding, which has been really, really uh, important uh, to us. Uh, the last thing I'll say, and I think I'll talk a little bit more about this in data is, we also, um, you know, to Eric's point about trying to find a way to get all these different partners and systems to talk to each other, uh, we've been able to bring in some resources to help us do that. Uh, and again, I'll, I'll share a little bit more about those, uh, I think, on a later question. How about the folks from Inland, Emma and Pete? Sure. What can you say about how you're using Cape funds and other resources? Absolutely. Please. So I'll, I'll I'll start with the high level stuff of you know uh, Cape funds directly are are the funds that offset the expense of having the two full time transition counselors and having one advisor. Uh, that's through looking at it through the college lens of overarching the transition into the college, but we also we're able to use, you know, our, our, our K-12 members have now, uh, some that didn't before have dedicated counselors now on their campuses as well that are full-time. And so it's, it's you know, uh, working in partnership to start the, the dialogue when they're on their adult ed side and then having our counselors come in to help with the transition. So I'm gonna say that's how the funds directly are being used. Uh, when I look at other partnerships and resources, we do work a lot with our community. So we have, uh, we work with the, some of the churches, uh, community cabinet meetings that we attend. Uh, the Mexican consulate has sponsored some events as well for individuals coming in. And we've had our transitions advisors come in to do uh, workshops, you know, on what our adults, uh, adult ed sites offer to help these individuals as they're coming into a new community. Um, additionally, you know, like I said, the, the Cape Funds has allowed for additional counselors uh, at other sites. And I, I'm really always amazed by some of the innovation that I see. And, you know, like I said, we have the dedicated counselors. Some of our counselors that we have working full time for adult ed are also adjuncts at the college. So that knowledge that goes between the two, you know, you really can't uh, put a limit. So I'm, you know, really fortunate to say we, we have different models just even within our consortium because being in San Bernardino County, we are the largest county geographically in the US. So we're very spread out. And even within our own consortium, we have a mix of, you know, rural areas and more urban areas. And so it's been a matter of finding, you know, what are the resources that our, our students need the most? 
So I'll, I'll let Pete share. Yeah, and I'm a product of those funds, right? So um, I was able to come in as an additional um, transitions counselor uh, just because of the demand um, and the way that the program was growing um, over the first few years. Um, and what we're able to do is, especially with those partnerships, is we're able to build and maintain those networks between uh, the adult schools and the college. So one, um, one, one thing that's come out of it recently is for our undocumented students and our AB 540 students is new ed codes that have been put in place starting this summer, um, which will allow students that are undocumented to take um, under six units um, at our campus um, without paying the non-residency fees. So it's those kind of partnerships that we create and we build and we take back to the adult school. Mm -hmm. Now we're able to transition the next group of students in. Um, we're able to do that as well with our non-credit ESL and ESL classes where we build those partnerships, we add additional courses or whatever we feel is necessary, and then we help our students from the adult schools transition. So um, those partnerships are, is one thing that really um, is forged with those additional funds that are being brought in. And it allows us to kind of move across of uh, more areas and, and help, uh, you know, more, more populations of students. Great, thank you. And Eric, and I promise not to make you last on the next question. No, 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 you can make me last, I like it. <laughs> <laughs> because I get to hear from all the great colleagues we got here. So um, again, how are we using Cape funds not to be um, repetitive, but the navigators. But one interesting thing about how we fund navigators is again, going back to that question, having transition on the forefront, we actually take the total cost of navigators directly off the top of our consortium allocations. So again, we force the fact that we will have those navigators funded wholly by the consortium, not by the individual program. Um, mm -hmm. Again, I talked earlier about, um, you know, leveraging dollars from WIO Title I to, to use the counselors that we have at our local one stops. That's a huge piece. Uh, we, we've also worked on grants, especially to increase support for ELL students. So we wrote an ELL grant that many of you are probably familiar with in the state. And I think we wrote it three times and, you know, third time was a charm. So we got it last year and we were able to add a, an EL, ELL counselor for the consortium to support transition into some of our new vessel and integrated courses. So that's another thing that we're leveraging resources from and then also supporting that from Cape. Uh, another thing that we've done and we've really expanded this lately is our employer partnerships. So our employer partnerships have, believe it or not, even grown with COVID um, because we're, we're able to connect um, via Zoom and other ways. Typically in our you know, transition, process because we require all students that come in our doors to enroll in a career pathway. And um, we have um, where we have most of our classes paid for because they're on the ETPL list. So we all typically funds all of our CTE classes. Um, and then our employer partners, nine times out of 10 provide a WEX or we have funding for a, a work experience. And so we're able to support transition that way. But again, a lot of our focus is, is career and college readiness. Um, we also do a lot of work with career readiness with our one stop in partnership. And so there's a lot of funds and time dedicated to that to ensure that students can trans transition successfully to either post-secondary or employment. Thank you. This is all really valuable information. Uh, and I hope those of you out there were, if you have questions to put them in the chat, and we'll get a chance to hopefully address some of those questions. Um, why don't we go to the next question, Jenny? Sure. So this next one is getting at the challenges. Um, and it's always good to ask about challenges. Don't be shy about responding to this one. We all have challenges. Um, we certainly heard about some of the challenges in the interviews we did. We thought it would be valuable to share with the group on the webinar today, what have been some of the most significant challenges that have been faced in your consortium with addressing students' transition goals? And if you could add to that, how have you addressed them and what resources have you used specifically to address those challenges? So, um, Eric, why don't you go first on this one? 
Sure. So um, again, I, I, I'm probably repeating something that's going to continue to be repeated, but I'll start with COVID. Uh, because COVID has created challenges we didn't even know we had. Um, one of the best examples I would say has been childcare. Uh, RASL numbers, for instance, locally went from approximately 270 students in an entire year down to 57. And a lot of it was the, the issue again, um, just getting the students in our doors, which we haven't even talked about transition yet, is the problem with parents um, not being able to have childcare for their students at home that were at home during the school day. And so one of the ways we got around this is we worked with um, our local school districts. We worked with um, Sutter County, Yuba County, a lot of our counties, and we're, we're able to acquire uh, childcare grants and other means to, to basically reduce some of these challenges and issues. Um, other transition for employment has been an issue even in our CT programs where hands-on labs or work experience has been another issue because we've had our clinical sites shut down, for instance, for our CNA class, where we had to go through and get an online approval for the CNA labs. Um, all of us have had to switch our curriculum to online curriculum, and um, that's been another issue. Career readiness, for instance, we posted a lot of our career readiness programs on YouTube. So we've made those available to students throughout our consortium to be able to make sure that we can still do that. And we've put them in multiple languages to make sure all students have these things. Um, what resources, again, are you using to address these challenges? I'd say it's a mixture. It's CAPE funds, it's WIOA funds, it's grants, it's partnerships. And, and really it's, again, the last part is partnerships have, have kind of kept things going because we still have a problem with students, not only that they're scared to, to come to school, but they're scared to go out to the workforce because of the COVID. Um, so, so again, working with partners, creating online options, um, having more service agencies in our interagency inter referral system has, has been definitely an advantage for us. Great, thanks, Eric. The theme of partnerships just keeps coming back again and again, and the resources that come with those partnerships when you invest in them. I think it's interesting to hear all the examples of that. Um, why don't we go next to um, Emma and Pete, if you could speak to some of the challenges at Inland. Sure. Um, I'll talk about some of the ones we had early on, and then I'll let Pete kind of compliment it with what he's been having to do now with COVID. Mm -hmm. And I'll say very early on, uh, looking at it more through the lens of the student and their barriers, because we had to figure out how to help them overcome is we, we did actually a presentation at the Cape Summit last year when we were in Orange County on the uh, uh, barriers students have and how to overcome them. And so we had 10 kind of high level areas and I'll, I'll just read them out. But um, in the presentation, our counselors went into detail about how they were coming across, you know, facing these barriers with students and then how to help them overcome them personally. And a lot of these, you know, really were holding them back either from transition or being successful in the programs that they were in. And so the, the 10 areas were, you know, cultural barriers, socioeconomic barriers, um, you know, immigration, you know, the residency status and questions they had around that, um, about understanding just the financial systems here, um, self-esteem issues, uh, the language barriers, um, academics, just learning the, the system here in the U.S. for a lot of them that were immigrants um, and, and making a decision, you know, do I go on to a job and go into employment or do I stay in, and get another certificate or, or earn a degree? Um, I'm sure Pete can talk a lot about right now, especially with COVID, about the digital literacy and that divide, you know, um, and then persistence. So their presentation revolved around these 10 areas, these 10 barriers, and then they talked to each one of them. And I'll say from looking at it, um, you know, fear of change is really important and that's universal to anybody trying to transition either into a new you know, phase of their life. And I think one of those barriers that we didn't have that I see now is, is uh, misinformation. Sometimes not having the right information at the right time can put you off a whole semester, maybe a whole year, or, you know, it could really delay you in being successful. So, you know, misinformation is a barrier. 
Um, solutions to that were the face-to-face -face interactions we were able to have, you know, pre-COVID with having our, our transitions counselors and advisor on site to be able to work one-on-one -on -one, uh, with students. Um, that, was, that was really big because it helped them they were in a familiar place, help them to overcome the anxiety they were feeling and to be able to ask those questions. I think more than anything, um, sitting with the counselor who you know, was, was compassionate and receptive to what they were going through, I think was really important. So I would say that's a, a lot of the barriers and how we overcame them. And really it became uh, having these dedicated individuals kind of meet them where they were at the adult ed sites. And Pete, you could talk about all of what's happening now with COVID. Yeah, and, and most of those barriers are still relevant now, but I think the one that sticks out the most or that our students are, are really having uh, difficulties with is, as Emma said, that digital literacy, right? But pre and post transition. So we're having a lot of difficulties with the students being able to um, just complete the application process or financial aid application or things of that nature, um, especially if they uh, lack the computer, you know, computers, you know, internet, um, most of them are trying to do it on their phones. So um, we've had to go in and get kind of created on, on, on the resources that we use. Um, obviously, Zoom is, is one of the main ones. Um, and then we've been able to use some other resources such as like Calendly to help us um, schedule a lot of our appointments with the students. Um, and, and the one that I've used the most out of everything is uh, Google Voice. And it's mainly because the students are much more comfortable having those um, those telephone conversations with me still being able to uh, text them or email them whatever additional information they might need. Um, um, so that's just getting them through the application process, which you know already could be difficult, especially if we're working with ESL students or um, undocumented students. Um, but now we're talking post transition and we're still facing those challenges with the digital literacy, right? Being able to log into Canvas um, to be able to complete their assignments um, check their student emails, things of that nature. So we've been fortunate at Valley um, that they've purchased Chromebooks and hotspots for the students. Um, so once they actually register for a course, they're able to check those resources out and utilize it and use it for the semester. Um, but on top of that, even though we gave them a computer, doesn't necessarily mean they know how to use it. So we've been able to partner with our tutoring services on campus. Um, and we're working on providing them tutors to be able to help them uh, just do basic functions such as logging in or creating a, a Word doc or, or things of that nature. So um, I think that digital literacy, especially right now in, in the virtual world that we're living, is really, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a challenge that's being faced by um, many of our students, more so than, than, than uh, what we have seen before. Mm -hmm. Okay. Frank, can you add a few words there? You and many of the people on this on this webinar know me, so we all know it's going to be more than a few words, right, Jenny? So, uh, but I, I will try to limit myself to, to three minutes. How many words I can, I can fit in? Um, I'm going to start actually with with uh, a piece about our our again our privilege of being in a small community and, and being able to really focus on uh, building navigation capacity from the beginning. Uh, we really, this, we've really focused on personalizing the experience and the pathway to the individual client. And we use client uh, intentionally because not all of the folks we serve become students. Uh, many of them do, but not all of them. So we look at really building these uh, personal pathway plans to meet the goals of the individual that allows us to start where they are, put in the supports that they need individually because no one's life situation is the same, uh, and then pull from this broad menu of both uh, on-site, in-person, in-community, and now in this more virtual world, you know, the vast array of menu uh, services, uh, supports, instruction that are available to us to, again, build that plan at a personal level. And when you do that, you're actually addressing, the, when you address those barriers on, the, on a personal level, what we found is you experience a lot fewer barriers in terms of access to support services and, and outcomes. With that said, there are a couple of real struggles. Some of them uh, are COVID related, and I'll touch on those in a second. Uh, one that, that continues uh, to kind of stick in my personal craw is the, the rigidity of career and degree pathways in general, right? A college degree path tends to have a very rigid sequence and structure to it that doesn't always lend itself to 
access for adult learners who may may have three jobs, to, uh, single parent, two children at home. So how are we able to look at what the individual needs to meet their immediate goal? Maybe they need two courses to get a promotion at work. So we're going to focus on those two courses or that one course, not necessarily the certificate or degree pathway right now. It's in the plan, but it's three or four steps down the road. Um, there are some new tools that are coming out uh, that are starting to be really helpful for us in that in that way that lets us help walk our clients through skills inventory against both industry requirements and um, the skills available or taught in college courses. And that's probably a whole nother uh, a whole nother webinar some other day. Uh, but it's a really amazing, amazing tool that can help us focus and find the course or courses that would be uh, have the most immediate value to our clients. And that that ameliorates a little bit of that sequence rigidity, right? If if we can say, my God, I get this one class, I get promoted at work. Now I'm working one job instead of two. Mm -hmm. Now coming back for that certificate or degree becomes much more um, feasible. Uh, Kyle, I will give you the name of the tool. It's called Skills Match. It's uh, from a company called MC. Uh, I do know that WestEd is also working on a, a similar uh, process approach, but I've been really pleased with the work uh, MC has done. I think uh, down the road, it has some uh, amazing potential for credit for prior learning. That's mm -hmm. probably also another, uh, another, uh, another. <laughs> no, thanks uh, for mentioning that though, Frank. We, there, there was actually a question in the chat just now. I, I, I saw it. I always, tool? I always try to, I try to keep the chat yeah, up when I'm, when I'm speaking. So, so I saw the question. Uh, <laughs> that's great. Uh, that's great. Other, I think we're going to be hearing more about that. The other very quickly uh, is, is really uh, COVID related. You know, our on-campus offices shut down a week ago, next Friday, March 19th. Uh, we realized very quickly, as all of you have mentioned, the struggle many of the folks we work with have, not just with using technology, but accessing the technology. And in, in a rural community, in a mountain community like Tahoe, connectivity. So the college and the school district gave out probably 500 hotspots. But in a town with really limited and sketchy cell service, we just gave them a really cool paperweight. Right? We didn't really connect them <laughs> to the internet. So uh, through some work with the local health department uh, and, and my consortia board, you know, uh, following all the guidelines, we actually opened an off-campus office in May so that we could begin providing one-on-one -on -one by appointment only services. And that was really critical early on. Uh, it also helped us pivot for a short period of time. Uh, and I know many on this call might not want to hear this, but pivot away from skill gains and hours in class and, uh, you know, EFL gains to, oh, my God, I need to I need to finish my unemployment insurance application. I, I would love to access some of this private philanthropic money that's available to help keep me and my family housed and fed. Um, you know, there were some great uh, at least Northern California opportunities that even provided uh, direct financial support to undocumented families. So we, again, that personalized approach, being able to reopen uh, helped us um, uh, meet those pieces. And you, you've all mentioned the ESL struggles. Uh, they're, they're real here as well. And sometimes that's a barrier even to apprenticeship, pre-apprenticeship programs. So working with partners like Burlington English or Voxy, uh, a company out of, uh, out of New York to help us uh, personalize some lessons in a way that can uh, allow us again to serve more folks in the community um, more effectively. Mm -hmm. All right. Good I think I exceeded my three minutes, but thanks. That, that question, yeah, I mean, a lot of fair. challenges, but also really inspiring to hear all the ways that you're addressing those. And our final question, and I think we've covered some of this, but um, we'll go at it anyway, is how do you track and use data to strengthen your transition services? And this is really important, obviously, because all of you out there in Cape Consortium land are constantly gathering data and need to report data both to Cape and to WIOA, et cetera. So um, why don't we start with Inland this time? Sure. So going back to um, 
AB 86 days, it was very primitive when we started and we would get spreadsheets from the state on populating some of these numbers. Everybody had different definitions of it. So it was kind of like the wild, wild west, you know, at the beginning. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. And so then, you know, in, in the years, you know, they, they were able to finally, you know, mandate everyone using the TE system. And so that seemed to help uh, streamline. But the college data doesn't align. We collect, you know, information on a semester basis where, you know, adult ed connects, collects it on a quarterly basis. So we were still struggling seeing, you know, the data at, at the same level. And so what we did, um, you know, we, we went from using TE for one semester to going back to, you know, things are collected in the MIS system for the colleges, then going back into using SARS, you know, so we've used and, and, and kind of actually created our own system at the end. We do the reporting that needs to be done, but, you know, Pete can talk more a little bit about the details that go behind us creating kind of an internal Google spreadsheet, pretty much, to be able to track the services and so that they can keep notes for when they meet with students again. So it's been an, an evolution. I, I don't have uh, a, a, an answer yet, you know, on, on a, an actual system that we're using. We're just kind of putting things together that make sense because as well, there's one thing you report to the state. There's another that your executive body wants to hear about transitions and how we're reporting them. So we have resorted to using internal data that we can generate from, you know, uh, our system is the SAR system. But at the same time, you know, that doesn't capture everything. So periodically, I do report out to our executive body, you know, how many students are, are coming through our system and kind of where they are. And, and I think Pete can talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, so we use um, three different data management systems. So as Emma mentioned, we use SARS. Um, and one of the main reasons we use SARS is just because it'll feed into MIS or we think it does. We're not really sure at this point. Um, also, because we are um, counselors for the college, it's the way that they track our hours and, and basically the ed plans and everything else that we're doing. Um, we also utilize our, our Outlook um, this way that our, our small consortium team can kind of see where we're at and what we're doing on a daily basis. Um, and then it also links to our Calendly and our Zoom. So we use that for tracking as well. And then we have more spreadsheets than I care to mention. Um, we have one for individual school. We have uh, those feed into another larger spreadsheet that we maintain by academic year. Um, and then we just kind of, you know, get gather all that data and pull out another spreadsheet um, that we provide to Emma and to the consortium. So um, data is one of those things that that we're constantly trying to find ways to um, to gather it, you know, in, in, in a more effective way. But it's just there's so much going on and we have to kind of report to so many different uh, individuals that um, or, or, you know, programs that it's, it's, it's just going to be one of those things, I think, uh, that we'll be fighting with for a while. <laughs> Great. And Eric, can you say First, a bit uh, about how you use data? Absolutely. So um, we started out, um, same as everyone else, as Emma said, it's, it was the wild, wild west. Um, with the college, we, we use SARS and the community colleges have probably been, you know, trying to connect to community colleges and our local LEAs has been the biggest challenge because we use different systems. And um, with the college using, you know, the SARS, we've got TOPS, we've got some of our attendance systems with ASAP. Um, and then we've got our one stops where we track transitions typically by hand, but there it's good. It's a good tracking system because there's required and mandated reporting. So. We, we, it's, we were kind of all over the map and that's when we reached out to Community Pro. And I know many of you are familiar with Community Pro. I know, Frank, you, you use Community Pro, I'm sure of it. You've used it longer than I have. But what Community Pro is, is helping us with is really aggregating that data together. I mean, we, and, and then re-disaggregating it and really using that information to drive program improvement as a consortium. Because individually, we kind of all knew, you know, okay, we've got our data and we would share it out but it was hard to aggregate it. And so Community Pro has been a big bonus for us, um, as well as tracking the referral systems. So with the referral systems, we have all of our partners um, within our mandated partners, as well as even our employers on Community Pro. We've expanded it out a little bit. And so we're in the process of using Community Pro as a referral system for even work experience and tracking those things. So Community Pro Suites, that's cool. Track all of, you know, whether the student made it to the appointment or not. 
and they put it in a pretty little spreadsheet that makes it much easier to bring it to the executive board and discuss, here's what we've done well, here's where we have it. So we've kind of went that direction, um, although we still have our folks individually. Uh, we share our TOPS programs between each other, um, looking at what we're struggling with, sharing best practices, and we're still actually, this is a never ending process, as Frank will probably concur with this. We're always finding out better ways to share and use data to drive instruction. I would say, you know, Community Pro is not the silver bullet. It certainly isn't, but it's certainly one program that has helped us improve our data sharing and tracking. So I think that's me. I'm just, I'm just gonna, I'm not gonna wait for Peter to say my name. That eats into my three minutes. So uh, Eric, you, you are correct. We are using, I think we've been using it since maybe July or August of 20, 2016. You're also right. It's not a, it's not a magic bullet and it, it continues to evolve, but it has been a big help for us in that umbrella component, getting uh, partners to commit uh, to sharing the data. Uh, you know, I've got, um, uh, I won't lie, I got sort of sporadic uh, file shares from the college, but that's finally been worked out. So now that information is coming on a quarterly basis based on report and we're on the quarter system. So that actually works, works well locally. Uh, in addition, our, because we, uh, of our unique structure and because we don't take uh, and don't want to take any WIOA Title II funding, we actually aren't required to use TE for anything other than our quarterly reporting uh, to CAPE. And so we have a different uh, LMS, uh, it's called LACES. I'm, I, I'm not a commercial for them, but it allows us to actually track not only the um, transition navigation services and support, but we can actually track hours by type. So we can track instruction hours separate from advising hours, separate from assessment hours, separate from onboarding hours, separate almost uh, from uh, uh, you know any kind of hours we want to we want to create because we have local access to to add additional uh, uh, fields into the system uh, without changing the overall piece, and that has really been critical in not only justifying our growth uh, in navigation, but the impact. And uh, unlike everyone else who, who talked about a lot of cool things, I'm going to share a couple of really quick data points. So uh, because of the system we have, because we're able to look at that level of detail, I know that in 2019-20 uh, 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 program year, my three transition navigators conducted over 1,400 individual appointments for over 1,500 hours of one-on-one -on -one service. And that's about, we serve about 300 clients a year. So we're a small, right? This, this may not be possible in LA yet, but someday it will. Um, so that's on average four plus sessions and five plus hours of this intense personalized navigation and advising service that we provide. Now, the reality is some folks, this, that does not include, by the way, onboarding, which is its own separate entity in our world. So once they get through two to three hours of, of sort of personalized onboarding, they then begin the, the actual navigation and, and plan creation pieces. Uh, so it helps us build relationships. But again, the reality is, you know, some clients have one or two sessions. We had one in that program year actually meet with their navigator 32 times because that's what they needed to be able to be successful meeting their goals. And we also are able to see that as the number of visits and efficacy of those visits increases, that the goal attainment and outcome uh, outcomes go up as well. So having that ability to sort of dig down to that level, so it's more than just the checkbox of a service was received, we can, we can do that too, but we can also see how much time we spend uh, providing that service, which has been really helpful and my consortium board sort of agreeing with these additional contracts and expansion of our, of our navigation uh, capacity. Um, I, think that, I think that's all I got. Yeah, great. great. We have some really varied solutions to some common issues there around data. Actually, um, uh, Jenny, if you- We wanna make sure we have- Can I just answer, there, there is a question yeah. in the chat. Uh, uh, Shannon, I, I, sorry, I just saw it. Uh, 
it wasn't easy, but you know, we we spent some consortium money to buy tools like Skills Match, which, which doesn't just serve our adult learners, but actually has uh, tremendous value to the college. So uh, I'm, I'm not I'm going to be honest and say, basically, I think we've 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 bribed them into this uh, into the sharing relationship, which is sadly sometimes now once they see the value of it, I don't think we'll have to continue to bribe them. But that, that's the truth. <laughs> Yeah, Shannon's question was was to Frank, how did you convince the college to give you data quarterly? Good answer. Um, okay, so we, we wanna allow some time at the end here for some questions. Um, these can be questions for our four panelists, questions for Peter, for myself. Um, before we go into that, or, or while people are writing their questions in the chat box, because we really encourage you right now to share what questions you have, write them into the chat, and we'll see how, how many of those we can get through um, today. Um, but I wanted to go uh, through the panelists one more time and, and just ask, do you have any closing thought or some final takeaway that you would wanna share on this topic of transition from adult education to post-secondary or to employment? Any final thoughts? Um, let me start, start with you, Eric. Sure. You, you, you talked about, Jenny, the, the theme of partnerships coming up more than once. And mm -hmm. um, again, putting service first and students first and making sure transitions at the forefront of all that we do. And, and I can't reinforce that enough. In order to do that, we have to have good partnerships and collaboration. Um, again, we're successful because we collaborate daily and weekly and and our collaboration includes business partners. It includes educators. It, we even have a, a, a Northern group of, of Cape folks that work together to share best practices and share ideas. And so transition, the challenges and, and all the pieces of that are always gonna change. We've got COVID, there's always gonna be something else. It's gonna change the course of what we do, but making sure you're collaborating and partnering well, um, again, that's, that's the big key to it, I think. Um, okay. Again, we're here to help. If, if anyone needs anything from us, um, we, we'd be glad to tour or share what we do and give ideas on how we do it. <laughs> Great. Appreciate that spirit, Eric. Great. And that partnership theme came right through in, our, in all the interviews we, we did. So important to highlight that. Um, Frank, what's your final takeaway? Personalization, 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 right? That, that is, we've built our program from the very beginning to focus on that. I cannot uh, stress that enough. P partnerships are clearly important, uh, value new and important processes, but uh, personalization uh, also lets us focus on the goals and outcomes that matter to our clients, not just the goals that matter to our system. So sometimes those goals are not, all, those goals don't always align. And so making sure we stay focused on what the, the client or student really needs and wants from us um, has been most achievable because of our approach to personalizing each individual's path through this wide array of supports and services. Um, and mm -hmm. we like, I, I don't want to be outdone by Eric. So I'm also happy to, uh, to uh, talk to folks and, and share more about what we do um, and uh, host a meeting in Tahoe when we can all, uh, all get back together. Great. Good. We'll yeah. be there. Um, let's go from there to Pete. Yeah. Like you said, just the partnerships, right? Um, we wouldn't be able to do what we do without the support of, um, the faculty and staff at the adult schools and, and, and also at the, the community college level, right? It's uh, really working together and putting the students first that, that allows us to do the great work that we do. Um, so I think just, just it, we're in a really unique position where we have some really, really good people that we work with and, um, and, and allows us just to, to help the students in any way they possibly can, right? So just taking a little bit of what Frank and Eric said, right? You know. Mm -hmm just all together. And then same with us, right? If there's any questions you have or um, want to kind of, you know, collaborate or, or share any of the ideas, um, we're also available. Mm -hmm. Great. Emma. Yeah, I'll just say, you know, we've, from the beginning, we followed a collective impact model, you know, mm -hmm. to make sure that we were all bringing in 
um, the resources that we had and breaking down those silos early on really helped to build trust and transparency, which were, I think, essential at the beginning of the AB 86 phase, uh, because there was a lot of mistrust and just misinformation out there. So I think that really helped. We brought in an independent facilitator that helped us build those relationships. And, um, you know, it, it's exciting now when we share our data and we say that, you know, we have a handful of students already ready to graduate from the community college that have chosen a post-secondary path. So it's really exciting. We have another handful that are, you know, within 20 units of graduating and another, you know, handful within, you know, starting. So it's exciting to see the different transition phases um, that our consortium has gone through. Great, great. Well, I want to thank our panelists so much. We're about to move on to take a few questions, but just, um, just want to appreciate you shared so many exciting specific examples of the innovative things you're doing. And, but it's also good to hear these wrap ups and just the, the sum up that at the heart of it all, it's these strong partnerships based on trust and real deep collaboration, and that those result in the really personalized services that, that make it work for, for students. Um, great to hear all that. We see a few questions in our chat box and I wanna encourage anyone else. We have um, just a little over 10 minutes to wrap up, but um, I, I see a great question here from Ilsa who says, and this could be for any of the panelists to, to think about how to respond to. Transitions are often thought of as one directional from adult ed to community college. Any thoughts on how to expand the conversation to transitions within adult ed, for example, from ESL or ABE, ASE to CTE, or referrals in the other direction from community college to adult ed? Does anyone have a perspective to share on that? And I see Frank's hand go shooting up. So that's actually one of the, I think one of the values we actually bring to the, to the college as a member of the consortium is we are uh, they have not had to invest significant uh, new or additional resources into some career center work and some supportive services work beyond what they already have because we we can provide that right that, that student is a member of the community so they are absolutely a, a viable uh, participant in our in our system so that co-location even as we grow and and expand our services a little and may maybe we're not headquartered at the college um, as a complete organization we will always maintain space there because there's tremendous uh, overlap uh, we've also had great uh, you know, prior to, 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 to the funding, um, I think ESL was kind of a, a, a valued but often forgotten aspect of the, of the local community college. And I think bringing in advance in the adult ed program really uh, has allowed us to connect with them uh, and share resources to support their work in ways uh, that are easier for us because we sit outside of the college and the K-12 governance structures, we can be a little more flexible. Mm -hmm. Any other perspectives on that? I can touch on that a little bit. Um, when we talk about the transition from college back to the adult school, so we've been, we've done really um, well with the um, the networking amongst our financial aid specialists. So they know that if they have students that aren't qualifying for the federal Pell Grant because of the lack of a completion of high school diploma or GED, they refer them to us. And by, and by doing that, we're able to um, connect them with the adult schools. Um, and then same with our admissions um, specialist and then our counselors as well. So any of the students that are coming in that are lacking that GED or high school diploma, they're referred to us and we, we can make those connections. So um, that has worked out really well for us and our students to, um, to be able to qualify for those the federal Pell Grant. Mm -hmm. Great, interesting. I would add an example I heard in some of the interviews um, addressing that question about the transition within adult education from ESL to CTE. There was an interesting example of using the integrated education and training model to, to support someone's transition um, from ESL to CTE still within adult education. I think that that's being done creatively. And then also on adult school campuses where CTE is in a separate building from ESL really being, being intentional about supporting students, introducing them to the CTE programs and, and often sort of walking people over there and introducing to the possibilities. Um, there's another great question that I think we're gonna have time for in our last few minutes. This was addressed to anyone. How are you having the transition conversation specifically with undocumented students? School isn't so difficult yeah. since they could be AB 540 eligible but career-wise or even the post-higher education reality of getting a job without documents 
Are there specific jobs or industries you lead them towards? Anyone have thoughts on that? Of course I do. <laughs> so uh, very quickly, uh, uh, only because it lets me reinforce personalization one more time. We've built those same kind of personalized relationships with local industry. And as I'm sure won't surprise any of you, hospitality and tourism is the industry uh, in Tahoe. Uh, and there are many, uh, many of their probably most valued and hardest working employees Um uh, may have may be undocumented residents or, or have undocumented residents in the family. And so we're able to sort of navigate that path between the partners that we know and the, and the needs of the individuals. And again, it, it comes back to that relationship building through, through personalization, not just with client students, but with employers and industry partners as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, and and if this is being watched by anybody in the tax uh, tax office, I have no idea what any of that means. <laughs> any other thoughts? Yeah, for us, one area that, that we always kind of highlight for our students is uh, definitely the CTE programs, right? Uh, our, our welding, our electricians, our HVAC. So um, as I said, now that we have the new ad code or ed code, that allows our students to, um, to take six units or less um, without incurring the non-residency fees. Um, we're, we're sure that's going to build uh, our CTE programs with those uh, mm -hmm. with our undocumented students. Great. Anyone else? I think we're getting pretty close to wrapping up here. Um, I'm going to move on to our last slide. Yes. So you'll see in the chat, Veronica has posted a link to an evaluation survey. We'd love to see your response on that. Um, you can click it right there in the chat to provide your feedback on this webinar. Um, I'm also gonna show on the next, uh, the last slide, or you'll see it on the copy of today's presentation that you have, the contact information for all of us who presented today. And all of us have agreed, you should feel free to reach out to any one of us. Um, we'd be really happy to hear from you. Also really encourage you to read the briefs. There is a link in the chat to uh, the brief related to this presentation. We also have a presentation coming up next week on a second brief related to immigrant integration and effective practices among adult education consortia related to immigrant integration. So encourage you to take a look at that. Um, let's see, there's also, um, wanted to let you know that, oops, I keep bumping the wrong screen. Um, we have scheduled a follow-up conversation about these transition effective practices, um, on April 8th at 10 AM. And you can look out for an invitation to that. The idea there is a, a very different format. It's designed as a peer learning circle, which is a very lightly facilitated conversation among you, um, among anyone involved in this work around transition practices, a chance to raise questions for each other, um, share what's working, what's challenging, and that will be a, um, just a very open dialogue. So encourage any of you with interest to take part in that. And then you should also look out for future invitations to join a Cape community of practice on this topic and other topics. There will be more, more um, opportunities in the future to, to um, have these conversations. Um, and with that, I think we're very close to needing to wrap up. Um, do you have anything more to share, Veronica? And no, thank you, Jenny, for going over everything that I have posted in the chat. So everyone does has does have access to the evaluation registration links. Um, I also posted our partner, the Foundation for Community Colleges. They're going to be hosting kind of a kickoff webinar for some of the work that they'll be doing for CAP around communities of practice. That webinar will take place on Tuesday, March 30th, and I believe it's at 10 o'clock a.m., but I posted the registration link in the chat, so be sure to register for that webinar as well. Um, and then also I posted the link for to register for upcoming webinars around 
High Road Alliance's work, um, CASAS is doing an I-3 report, and then Westhead has a host of webinars that they will be hosting between now and May. So I provided the registration um, the registration website so that you can look at all of the offerings that we have and continuously check that because we are always adding things. And as Jenny mentioned, we will be setting up registration for the 8th PLC and we'll send an invitation out to everyone who either registered or participated in today's um, webinar so that you'll have access to that opportunity to come back together where you all could engage in conversation. Like Jenny stated, it's a lightly facilitated conversation and we understand that those are definitely desired in the field. So yeah, that's all that I have. Um, anything else from High Road Alliance or any of the panelists? No, I think we're ready no, this to was great. respect we're everyone's ready. time. <laughs> yeah. Thank the panelists, thank, uh, thank Cape and SCOE. And uh, we, this is an ongoing conversation. We're all learning as we go, so. Thank you very much for taking the time to be part of this. And thanks also to everyone who participated in the interviews when we reached out um, to learn more about this topic. It's been a really valuable effort and we look forward to continuing yep. the conversation. Thank you, Peter and Jenny, very much. Goodbye, everyone. Adios. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. See you next week. Bye, -bye. Bye.